Hello and welcome to CND's first broadcast since the COVID-19 lockdown began. Um, my name is Ian Chamberlain and I am CND's Press and Communications Officer. I'm joined today by Kate Hudson, CND's General Secretary, and Dave Webb, Chair of CND. Hi. We have called this first broadcast, You Can't Nuke a Virus. It is the first of a series of live discussions and I will give you the details of next week's edition at the end of the programme. The lockdown has created some practical challenges for those of us campaigning against nuclear weapons. Um, CND is exploring the different ways in which we can work to overcome these challenges and I know you will be too. Um, we will discuss some of these um, ideas later in the programme. The, the pandemic itself has also highlighted the distorted priorities of governments over many decades, in particular the ways they assess and address our security needs. We have a situation where £205 billion are being pumped into a nuclear weapon system that makes us less safe and yet we don't even have basic things we need to address this pandemic like PPE, PPE face masks and ventilators. We are living through the very bleak implications of many years of poor policy choices that haven't responded to human and social needs. We have also seen the power of the government to act if there is the political will to do so something CND has been calling for for many years is defence diversification, repurposing defence companies and their workers, including those involved in building nuclear weapons, to move them away from building weapons of mass destruction towards creating socially useful goods. For decades we've been told this is impossible, that scrapping Trident would inevitably mean joblessness for thousands, and yet, in the last few weeks, we have seen the government speaking to defence companies like Rolls-Royce and Babcock International about building the ventilators we desperately need. So apparently it is possible after all. Kate, you've been writing about some of these things in the last couple of weeks. Can I invite you to uh, comment here? Yeah, thanks very much, Ian. If you look back at government security strategies for the, the whole of this century, in fact, you can see that governments have been quite preoccupied with the risk of pandemics and, of course, also the risk of um, resistance to antibiotics. So the health question has been really at the top of the political agenda. In 2005, Tony Blair's government, they published their uh, uh, security review and they actually said that the World Health Organization had congratulated Britain for being ahead of the curve and really preparing well to meet this kind of eventuality. So only 15 years ago. Uh, in 2010, the coalition government began a process of uh, putting security threats into tiers. So you could see the kind of priority level of the different threats. And they put uh, pandemics um, and, and other kind of public health problems and, and you know, big issues as a tier one threat. Um, and at the same time, of course, they, at that time, they downgraded Trident's issues, state on state nuclear threats to a tier two threat. So they'd kind of got the right idea about what are the 21st century threats. They had tier one was pandemics, it was climate change, it was organized crime, uh, terrorism, all the things that we would recognize. So they, they got that, um, but they didn't get the idea that you should actually invest money in dealing with those things and you shouldn't be spending it on Trident. And then unfortunately, in 2015, once again, they identified pandemics as a really big issue. But what did they do? They continued spending on Trident and they also continued with their austerity program and cuts to the National Health Service. So we have this situation now. Of course, as Ian just mentioned, we're faced with this massive catastrophic pandemic and our systems of health systems, hospitals, equipment are chronically underfunded. And this is the kind of skewed priorities, unfortunately, that successive governments have followed. So certainly in our campaigning, um, many of you will recognise over the last 
decade, perhaps since the financial crash, we've been highlighting spend on NHS, not Trident. You know, that's the kind of message that we have to continue to get over. It's good that government seems to be um, moving towards some form of arms conversion. If that is going to happen, I'm sure Dave will explain that, that that needs to go on after the crisis. You know, we can't go back to the world as it was. That's not possible. It's also not desirable. Thanks, Kate. Um, Dave, um, um, one of the sensible um, demands that we've seen in the recent weeks is a call for an international ceasefire. Um, on the 23rd of March, the UN Secretary General urged warring parties across the world to lay down their weapons in support of the bigger battle against COVID-19, um, the common, common enemy that is now threatening all of humankind. Do you want to comment on that? Yes, thanks. Um, as Guterres points out, uh, it's usually the most vulnerable people, the women, the children, people with disabilities, the marginalised and, and the displaced who pay the highest price in, in wars. Uh, and they're also at the highest risk of suffering devastating loss from the virus as well. Um, in many war-torn countries, health systems have collapsed uh, altogether almost. The new health a few health professionals that there are have often been targeted as well. Refugees and others displaced by the violent conflict are, are doubly vulnerable. And as he said, the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. Apparently this call has been endorsed by some 70 member states so far. There are regional partners, also non-state actors, uh, civil society networks and organizations and all the UN uh, messengers of peace. 11 countries involved in long-term conflicts have also responded. I think it's all came about from um, an online petition by Avaz, which uh, last time I looked was around 1.5 million signatures mm. so far. I mean, it would be good to get that number up even more, I think, if we can. Um, so as Gustaris, uh, as Gustaris said, to silence the guns, we must raise the voices of peace, and that's what we, we need to do. There's still some way to go, though. Action is needed, not just words. Uh, there's something like 200 wars and military conflicts going on at the moment, um, which bring misery and suffering uh, and are a handicap also to any meaningful local attempts to deal with the pandemic. Um, I think the International Peace Bureau has put out a statement about the G20 online summit, which occurred just a few days after uh, the uh, Secretary General's statement. Um, they issued a statement recognizing that global action, solidarity and international cooperation are more than ever necessary to address this pandemic. That it's a powerful reminder of our interconnectedness and yet it's fails to, under, to apply this thinking to the need for peace. The stimulus of, that they've um, suggested or, or, or have offered of $4.8 trillion should be used to protect the jobs of working people, of incomes and reinforce social welfare systems for the people that need it, not just as a way of making money for the already too wealthy, such as the arms manufacturers. So we have to be really careful where this money is going and how it's spent. As the IPB says, the International Peace Bureau says, we must make sure our healthcare systems do not play second fiddle to military expenditure. The world spends something like 1.8 trillion US dollars on the military and still NATO reinforces its irresponsible call uh, for more spending in demanding that its members allocate 2% of their GDP to the military, which unfortunately the UK does. I think the UK defence budget at the moment is something like 40 billion pounds mm. per annum. Um, just think what we could do with uh, some of that, just a bit of that, and how we, if we'd have spent it properly in the first place, we wouldn't be in this situation where we are at the moment, where we can't offer testing of, for the virus and we can't uh, build the ventilators quickly enough to, to what uh, requirements. Uh, another kind of victim of this in a way is the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty 
uh, review conference, which was due to take place in New York in April and May. And that's now been postponed, I think, until next year, where, where it might take place in Vienna, in the UN in Vienna. Um, and our side event, which we were going to hold then, was going to be called Will Britain Honour Its NPT Commitments and Disarm? I think we're hoping to do that online now. We are, yes, yes. Yeah, so we'll there's still a about. chance to join in. Yeah, or a better yeah. chance now actually to join in than there was when it was in New York. Great. Um, there's also, uh, there was also going to be a world conference on the abolition of nuclear weapons to take place around the same time in New York. Uh, that's now also, of course, had to be canceled, but that too will be, parts of it anyway, will probably take place online. So there's more opportunity for more people to get involved in these really major events, which is, um, you know, in some ways a good thing. Great, thanks Dave. Um, Kate, perhaps less helpfully than the UN Secretary General's comments, um, we saw at the end of March the US carrying out nuclear war games. Can you tell us about that? Yes, well this is an um, indication of how things can evolve during the current crisis um, in, in a less good way than our um, fringe meeting for the NPT review conference. Uh, earlier this year in, in February, the United States and NATO began a massive, massive um, program of war games in Europe called uh, Defender 20 Europe. And in effect, it was the simulation of an invasion of Europe, the continent of Europe, by the United States. And it was in line with uh, Trump's security strategy of pre preparing for mass war against Russia and China. And there were 30,000 US troops coming over to add to uh, US and other NATO troops already in Europe. So they began that massive process uh, just at the time when the virus was really beginning to take off in Europe. So you can imagine, that I'm sure they were in consternation quite rightly, and I think mid-March they declared that in, in the interests of the safety of their personnel and, and so on, health and safety, they would all be withdrawn uh, back to the United States. But they did uh, retain some, um, some of the exercises, the training exercises so-called, so there's a kind of very, very much scaled down version. But what we learned from uh, Italian activists who follow this very closely, obviously, because they have NATO nuclear weapons in Italy. They said that there was evidence that there had been uh, US uh, nuclear bombers um, flying over Northern Europe. And they also pointed to a statement by General Walters, who's, who's head of uh, US and NATO military forces in Europe. Uh, he said that all NATO exercises are underpinned by um, the nuclear capacity of NATO. So even uh, when things are in such a terrible situation as facing Europe and facing humanity with the virus, still they found ways to um, use, um, take, take the nuclear weapons out there on fighter bombers and so on. I mean, it, it's just... And that works. Well, another example of the kind of skewed priorities of these governments, you know, whether it's the Johnson government or whether it's the Trump administration in the United States. So we want to see an end to that. And again, it's an, another issue around what kind of world do we want to see once the virus is over. Um, and I could just point you to something fantastic that I read this morning in the Financial Times. I'm sure you can get it online if you don't subscribe. Arundhati Roy, you'll know her as the most extraordinary Indian peace activist and a great champion of the World Social Forum, a marvellous writer and activist. And she was saying that the engine of capitalism has come to a juddering halt as a result of the virus. You know, we all have to think about whether we, when it's over, we want to try and mend that engine or do we want a completely different engine <laughs> to that, a new, a new type of engine? And I think we all need to be thinking about that. You know, C&D and uh, civil society movements, the social solidarity that's be te been taking place um, across the country and internationally has been uh, remarkable and amazing. And it shows us what 
our societies and our communities can do. So I think I'm sure we all agree that we want to take more of that forward into the post-virus world. Yeah, the, the solidarity we've seen for the NHS workers and the clapping on the Thursdays has just been brilliant. And yeah, that ties in quite nicely with a question I had for um, Dave, which, you know, with so much going on, we would normally be out in the streets protesting, organising public meetings, you know, all the usual um, campaigning activities that we're engaged with. Um, but while the, the crisis shows millions of us, you know, what needs to change so clearly, um, does the, the lockdown also mean that we can't actually campaign for the change that we need? Dave? No, not at all. In fact, um, <clears throat> there's still, of course, lots of things to do, plenty of issues. Um, there's the issue about more money for the NHS, not, not for Trident. There's the diversification that's already been mentioned, the conversion of some parts of industry to build ventilators where we were told that was almost impossible for manufacturers to change the, what, what they build. Uh, now we're seeing that uh, it's not only possible, if you've got the will to do it, it's, uh, it can happen very quickly. Um, so there's all of these issues, don't bank on the bomb. Uh, there are, you can look at online if you have an online system to see what companies are supporting nuclear weapons by, by building them or, or whatever. You'll find that Lockheed Martin, BA Systems, Jacobs Engineering, General Dynamics are all involved heavily in building the nuclear weapons that, we're, uh, that the world doesn't need. So if you're part, you know, if you're a member of a bank or a pension fund or, or whatever, uh, or your council may invest in these different companies, ask them to disinvest in those companies, to divest from, from those companies. Um, so there's a lot of work you can do online there. Uh, you, we also, I think we're trying to, uh, it's been a CND little campaign, to try to keep the Minister for Peace and Disarmament as part of the Labour Party uh, shadow government. Um, and that needs to be done. I think we know the leader will now be uh, Keir Starmer. Um, so we can now ask him if he can actually ensure that this, uh, this very important post is, is actually kept up. Uh, there's also trying to get your city to, to sign up to the ICANN, the international campaign. Uh, against uh, nuclear weapons in support of the, the uh, treaty for the Pro prohibition of nuclear, nuclear weapons. I think ask, try and get your council to, to join in alongside Manchester, Leicester and a number of other councils that have shown their support. Um, check up with your local group, uh, see what they're up to. If, uh, if you haven't got a local group, might maybe start one. You know, you probably know a few people online. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a big group. It can be a small group, but you can share ideas. Um, you can write letters, send emails to newspapers, MPs. Uh, take Bruce Kent's advice that he sent uh, um, earlier on on, on a CAD uh, e email. Um, don't make the letters too long uh, and uh, make sure that they're easy to read and easy, stick to one or two points, don't go r ranting off like I often do. Um, <laughs> and there's plenty of online so, so petitions to sign as well. Uh, we put out, CND puts out regular calls for support on various things, but there's also campaigns which are related to end the sanctions on Iran, to stop the US blockade of Cuba, et cetera, et cetera. So many things happening. You can, if, if you can, you can tweet, you can blog, you can use Facebook, Instagrams, make even a short video with your phone, put it on uh, the, the web somewhere. Talk to friends and family, co workers so many things you can do. Just make sure that these issues get discussed. They're extremely important issues. This is now, we, ha well, got, we have an amazing opportunity to clarify once and for all what the importance of some of the things we've been saying for years you know, divestment, um, putting our, our money and our care with people and making sure that people are safe, not just say the state is, is um, cared for. So we um, are formulating also in CND a, a, a series of webinars, as, as you mentioned, there'll be one next week with Paul Rogers and perhaps uh, also several others after that. So it's a chance to inform yourself 
uh, make sure you understand what the issues are, make sure you can um, answer some of the questions you might get uh, asked. Great, thanks Dave. Um, we've had a few questions from CND um, supporters and members um, from across the country. Um, a question from Pam was, um, I'll ask you this one, Kate. Um, can CND share um, some template letters from which to draft letters to local um, and regional media about the global health crisis and waste of resources on nuclear weapons and war games? Thanks very much for that, Pam. Yeah, that's a very timely and appropriate question. Um, you see before you Ian Chamberlain, our Press and Communications Officer, who's the colleague um, who will prepare some template letters. They're great for sending off to the media, um, press releasing even with um, quotes from local people. So we will get those sorted for you and we will put them on the CND website next week. So keep on checking there. Um, Dave, um, one for you here from Janet King, who is a CND member in Bromsgrove. Um, she asks, after COVID-19, um, the economies of even the wealthiest countries will be much decreased and the national debt will have risen. Um, do you see this as an op opportunity to campaign strongly on our waste of money, waste of lives message? Yes, thanks, thanks Janet. Um, absolutely. Uh, this is kind of almost playing into our hands in a way. I mean, we, are, we, are, we have to reassess the way that we spend money as, as a nation uh, and what our priorities are. Um, we will not have as much money as, as we have now, and we don't have a huge amount now, to be honest. Uh, so we need to be very careful. We need to emphasize to our MPs and to the Prime Minister what we think the priorities of the country should be and let's not waste money, waste lives, waste time on, especially on things like nuclear weapons, when there is uh, a whole welfare infrastructure to rebuild, really. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, Alison Sheriff um, um, asked, I have been lobbying my MP about this issue, for, but to no avail. Um, why is it so difficult to withdraw from the nuclear arms race when we were promised several years ago to, that we would do so? Um, why are even Labour MPs reluctant to face this challenge? And could this be the pivotal moment? So similar to the last question in a way, but what, yes, why, why aren't politicians really raising you know, to this uh, challenge right now? Yeah, first of all, thanks to those of you who are commenting on the chat column, which is why I keep on looking over there with my glasses on to see the small type. Um, yeah, I think one of the key problems is that for a long time now, Britain's nuclear weapons have been associated with our status in the world. You know, it, it shows in the eyes of many politicians that we're kind of a heavy hitter and we've got a seat at the top table. And in spite of everything that's happened and all the real challenges, that idea is still there. So, for example, we know that Tony Blair, when he was writing in his autobiography about the decision on whether or not to replace Trident when it first came up in Parliament in 2006, in his autobiography, he said, I looked at it from both sides and there was a good case for getting rid of it, but I thought not to have it would be too great a downgrading of our status as a nation. You know, and that continues. Uh, that idea uh, across many parties, not all of course, but many governmental parties. Um, and unfortunately with many Labour politicians, they think that the Tories will uh, make them look weak on defence. You know, it'll be a way of attacking them. You know, they need to reassess this because the majority of people don't want Trident. So those are the kinds of reasons. And I think post virus, you know, with the whole issue going on um, about to see Bruce Kent seems to be about to appear there <laughs> um, with the um, in the post virus situation with more money, you know, having been put into the health service and having been put into people's needs. Let's make sure it stays with those, you know, let's get the new Labour leader. Let's all write to the new Labour leader and say, you know, the kind of priorities we want him to be following. Um, something slightly spontaneous has happened that was off the script. Bruce Kent is um, joining, joining us. Are you there, Bruce? I'm there. Are you there? <laughs> yeah, if you speak a little louder, I think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we, we can. can. 
Welcome, yeah. Bruce. You put your hand up. Did you, did you have a question for us or did you want to say something? I want to say something. I, I don't ask questions. I'd just like, <laughs> to, like to say this. No one has mentioned so far that this new trident we're building is costing £205 billion pounds, and to get the thing out at sea, it means we have to borrow the missiles from the United States. It absolutely is not an independent nuclear weapon. And most people don't realize that. They think it's ours. Well, it isn't ours. It's completely dependent. It's like hiring a dinner jacket from Moss Bros or somewhere, but belongs entirely to the Americans, whether we can have an effective deterrent or not. And it's time to press that point, I think. I think I've talked long enough. I think one point, as I said before, or at least as Dave said to me before, one point is enough to make. Don't scratch your chin, Dave. I'm looking at you. Bye now. <laughs> Thank you, Stu. Thanks for joining us, Bruce. That was really nice, unexpected surprise. So thank you. Um, um, so um, we've run over a little bit. I hope people don't mind with that. Is, shall, shall I take just a couple of more questions before we... Can I, can I just answer one of yeah. the questions that's come up on the chat? Um, somebody asked for a list of the companies that I mentioned. I think the best way to get the companies, uh, a list of the companies is to look at Don't Bank on the Bomb. There's a website called Don't, Don't Bank on the Bomb and a report, full report on uh, the companies involved in um, nuclear weapons manufacture and production. And uh, what you have to do then is to check to see whether any of the people that invest money for you on your behalf for your pension or whatever, are, are, are working with those companies or, or investing in those companies. Great. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, can I just give you a final one, Kate? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, a question from uh, Jean-Pierre Merlac. Um, why can't CND stop using words like trident and deterrent? Um, they are convenient euphemisms used by supporters of nuclear weapons to hide their real meaning. Thanks, Jean-Pierre. Good question. Actually, in CND, we are pretty careful about terminology. We do use the term Trident because that is the name of Britain's nuclear weapon system, but we always call it the Trident nuclear weapon system. And in fact, people who've ever come into CND office or worked in CND office will know there's a complete ban on using the word deterrent because absolutely that's the government never talks about Britain's nuclear weapons system. They talk about the deterrent, you know, as though it's some kind of sacred thing. Um, and we have to move absolutely uh, disregard and, and deplore the use of the term deterrent, because as you say in your question, these are weapons of mass destruction. We have to name them for what they are. So thank you for raising that. Very important. Great. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you to everyone who sent um, so many um, brilliant questions. Um, we, we will definitely follow up more of these questions um, in next week's episode of this programme. Um, and just to say something about next week, um, next Saturday at 3pm, we will be speaking to Paul Rogers, who is the Emeritus Professor of Peace Studies at Bradford University. Um, Paul is a good friend of CND um, and he recently wrote two articles, one for um, Open Democracy um, and one for the Oxford Research Group. Um, in the Open Democracy article, he, he argues um, that the UK security services are about to face some very awkward questions when the pandemic is over. Um, and he goes on to say, quoting Paul here, um, that if and when we do come through this global crisis, it must be recognised that doing so must be a dress rehearsal for the even bigger global threat of climate breakdown. If governments and the wider international community can learn to work closely and successfully together on, on controlling COVID-19, it could serve as a vis uh, vitally important guide to this even greater challenge. End quote. And I would add to that um, that it must also be a dress rehearsal for the work that countries need to do together to eradicate nuclear weapons. Uh, nuclear weapons as well as the climate crisis are the twin 
existential threats we face and they must be both confronted together. Um, and Paul's other article was for the o Oxford Research Group um, where he talks about the role of um, uh, uh, neoliberalism in the uh, catastrophe that we're experiencing at the moment with the pandemic and the, our inability to re respond appropriate um, to it. So we look forward to hearing from Paul. Do email us any questions you may have for him. Um, and I thank Kate and Dave for joining us today. Thank you, Kate. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for coming along. And thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for participating. Now wash your hands, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you all for listening. Um, and I hope you will join us next week at 3 p.m. on Saturday. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.